Well, I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. Of course, we have uh, Facebook Live, and then we upload our, our sermon on uh, our website, vineyardchurch.com, at, you know, later in the week, and so uh, we have people join us that way. But uh, we are in a series that we're doing. We just started last week. We're going to be talking about building relational bridges. Now, we have a bridge behind us because we have this, this is a, uh, a symbol of what we're trying to do. We certainly talked on Easter about building a relational bridge to God and to make a difference with our lives. And, and, to, and, and, and then when we walk across a bridge that God built through Jesus, God starts to put that in us where we want to make a difference. We want to start building bridges towards others. So over the next eight weeks, that's what we're going to be doing is talking about how do we build bridges to make better relationships with people around us. How can we, especially people that maybe are, uh, there's broken things, there's, there's, there's problems, there's ought between us, and how do we build that? And things that are healthy, how do we make them better? So we're going to be talking that, about that, and we're going to launch today about how to build friendships, how to have good friends in your life. That's important, you know. I was looking at some surveys this week on the internet, and it was saying that over the last 25 years, that people have far fewer close friends. And 25% have no close friend at all. Now, that's not the way it should be. And you can be successful in life. You can, your business can be blowing up. You can have all kinds of great things happening. You can, you can be a millionaire. You can be popular. You can be successful. But if your relationships in your life are not doing well, you can be miserable. I mean, you can just be in a terrible place and everything else seems to be going so well. So it's important that we work on our, our, our relationships, particularly those that are close, close friends. I love this verse here where it says, it is not good for man to be alone. This comes from Genesis. This is the very first thing uh, that is happening in the Bible. Uh, God has placed man in this great environment. Everything's good for him. I mean, he's got, you know, beautiful waterfalls and tons of great food. It's all organic. It, you know, it's, it's good for you. And uh, the animals are nice. They're playing nice. So it's like this ultimate zoo where you can actually, uh, you know, pet all the animals you want. But he says, it is still not good because you're alone. See, God didn't design us to live this life alone. We're supposed to have uh, other people in our lives. God wants us to be connected socially with other people. It's an important part of what he wants from us. So we're going to look at that today. Uh, and uh, what I want to do is just start out by just pointing out, maybe it's the obvious, but two types of friendships. One is his casual friendships. Casual friendships are the result of circumstances. In other words, you know, you go to school with that person, you sit next to them in class, you maybe, you know, you have a job and you work next to them. Maybe they're your neighbor. Maybe you go to the gym and you kind of always see the same person at the same time and you get to know them. I mean, all those, you know, you're, you're at the soccer, uh, you take your kids to the soccer uh, game and you're always sitting next to the same parents and you get to know, those are friends by circumstance. They're like casual friends. They're not necessarily close friends. So close friends, their close friends are those you make a choice. And it's important because the closer they are to you, the more they influence you and the more you influence them. So you don't want that to be by default. That's something you want to actually choose. So uh, I need to choose my friends carefully. We really do. You know, the Bible says to do that. In fact, there's some people for your closest friends you should not have. Did you know that? There's some people that kind of got, the Bible says you shouldn't really be having these particular people as your closest friends. People that are lazy, people that are angry, people that are immoral, people that are greedy, people that are unbelievers. They say, I don't believe in God. They're not supposed to be your closest friends. What are you supposed to do with, with people that are like that? Are you supposed to shine them on and, you know, put your nose up? I'm better than you. No. You're supposed to love them, right? We're supposed to still accept people and love them. But accepting somebody does not mean you approve of everything they do. It means you love and you accept them, even though they're different. We have people in our lives, right, that are kind of odd. They're flaky, and I go, you know, I love you anyways, you know. You're a good egg, even though you're a little cracked. <laughs> That's kind of, I mean, we all do that, right? That certainly happened to me recently. I was, uh, Sharon and I were in the car together. We were in her car. She's got a, like, a silver a minivan. 
And so how many silver minivans are there? There's a lot, right? So we're in this silver minivan. And I said, Sharon, I need to go to the bank, withdraw a little money real quick. So she pulls in. She stays in the car. I run into the bank, get a little money. I'm walking out. I'm not really paying attention. In the meantime, while I'm in the bank, another silver minivan pulls up right next to Sharon. Some ladies in it. And I, so I, I don't realize. I just walk in. And I just come out of the bank, open up the door, sit in, close the door, look over. It's a different lady. What happened to my wife? And she also looks pretty freaked out, you know, like, what is this guy going to do to me? I'm so confident. This is my car now. We're in here together. And so I look over a little bit, and I see on the, a car next to us with my wife's head in that car, and she's looking at me like, I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm married to this guy. So I get out of the car after apologizing, kind of, you know, with my tail between my legs, Get into the car with Sharon. She looks at me like, you know, this is what I'm married to. You know, this is, this is as good as it gets for me. You know, we need to have leeway when people act weird, right? Different. I mean, that happens. But when we're choosing our close friends, we need to really do. Uh, we don't want that to be default. We want people that will help us become more like what he wants us to be. We have, we're, on, we're on journey. We're on a mission. And God wants you to align yourself with people that will help you do that. So uh, notice this. It says, a mirror reflects a man's face, but what he is really like is shown by the kind of friends he chooses. There's something about the, cho- the friends we choose. Not, not we, you know, we happen to work next to us. We choose. That says something about us. It says something about our character. If you're not sure, then that's what you looked at. Parents, if you're not, if you're, you don't connect with your teens very much, you're wondering what, what, you know, what they're like, look at their friends. That's scary, I know. But that's certainly one of the things. It says a righteous man is cautious in relationships. In other words, we choose. And so you want somebody who's, who's going to help you and propel you in your life mission, what God has for you. And so you choose your, your friendships. Now, you want, here, here's how you, what you do. If you, if you want, these are the kinds of people you want in your life. You want people that will stimulate you mentally. In other words, God's given you a mind, and, and there's things he wants you to do with that mind. And, and, and you need people that will help you grow, you know, grow in that. And, and, and certainly that's something that, that, that the Bible talks about. It says here, notice, it says, uh, he who walks with the wise grows wise. That's one of the ways we grow in wisdom, choosing the right people in your life. You, you start to develop. You start to grow in that area. Another great verse, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And so we, we, we come together, we sharpen each other, we grow I don't know if you know, uh, but J.R.R. Tolkien, he's the author of The Lord of the Rings, he had a group that they met every Tuesday night in this little pub. He, the little group was called the Inklings. The pub was called the Bird and the Baby. And they would meet and they would drink some beers together. And it was uh, just other famous writers like, uh, like C.S. Lewis uh, and uh, and. Uh, uh, just other, other poets that you probably wouldn't know of, but they were famous of his day. And they would just read excerpts, and they would challenge each other. Hey, do you see an area I can get better at? Another example is uh, Ben Franklin had uh, a, some really brilliant people that he brought together. He called them the My Most Ingenious Friends Group. And they would meet, and they met actually for 40 years. That's one of the reasons Ben Franklin was making inventions into his 80s, into his 70s, 80s, and even into his early 90s. He, most of his biggest inventions happened after the age of 70 for him. He wasn't looking to retire at that. I mean, he's growing. He's expanding. And how did that happen? He had a group of people helping him, stimulate his, him mentally. Thomas Edison, same thing. He had a group called My Mastermind Alliance where he grew, they came together, and just over a six-year period, they had over 300 patented inventions, which averages to one small invention every six weeks, one major invention every six months by just coming together, not solo, as a group. You can do more together as a group. Paul had Aristarchus, Luke, Demas. He had Mark, Clement, 
people that help them. So how about you? Do you have people that in your life that help challenge you and stimulate you mentally to help you think? Secondly, another thing that when you're choosing uh, friends, you want people that will sum- support you emotionally. You know, they'll help, they'll be there for you. I love this verse here. It says, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born in adversity. It's in difficult times when you really know who's there for you. They're not just hanging out. They're not farewell. They're friends. They're really there for you. They, they stand with you when everybody else is walking out there. There, The story of Job in the Bible is a story of a man who had the, his, the bottom fall out on his life. Everything went bad for him. And uh, I mean, he lost his health. He lost his kids. His kids were killed by, by terrorists. And he lost his business, totally collapsed, an economic collapse and, you know, a tornado, all kinds of things happened. So he's like, he's like in this terrible place. Well, his friends hear about it. They don't live that close by. Uh, and so they, they decide, let's go visit our friend Job. They kind of coordinate, they meet at a place. And then they're, as they're walking up to Job, Job is on the ground. He's just there, just in a pile, just in a mess. And they see that, and they, as they're walking up, they just start crying. They just start weeping. Their friend is in this terrible place. And then they don't say anything. All they do is they come up next to Job, they see him, and they sit, and they lay on the ground with him. And then they lay there, and they're with him for seven days, and they don't even speak a word. Then they go on, the rest of Job's about what they say. They probably should have just shut up. It was the, that was the best moment right there. <laughs> but what were they doing? They were connecting with him emotionally. Right? That, and we need that, especially if we're in a difficult place. We need people to connect with us emotionally. And uh, the Bible says uh, that's what it means. It says, bear one another's burdens. You're there for them. They've got a burden. You know, a burden is easier to carry when somebody else is helping you with it, right? Okay, number three, you want people that will strengthen you spiritually. Strengthen you spiritually. That's really important because we're spirit beings. We need people that help us in that area. We can easily get caught up just... And, you know, the Bible talks about it living in the carnal life, just physically, just what you see and what you touch and smell and the five senses. But there's a spiritual part of us. And we need to make sure that people in our lives are helping us. It says encourage one another and build each other up. And so he's talking, that happens with other believers. You see, you can have friends that you can't have fellowship unless they're, unless, unless they're a believer in Christ. You can have friendship. Because friendship is mind and emotions. But the spiritual part, they have, to, they have to be a believer in Christ. They have to have the spirit of Christ in them to help you in that area. That's what it means for fellowship. Fellowship is you're going in the same direction. Fellowship comes from the word two fellas in the same ship. That's not true, but it's, <laughs> it sounded kind of weird, right? So I'm maybe right. Oh, is that right? No, it's not right. But what is true is, is it's two people that are going in the same direction spiritually. Hey, we're, I can support you. I'm there for you. And we need that in our lives. Spur one another on towards love <clears throat> and good deeds. There's a tendency for us to not do that. That's why we spur one another on. Hey, you're doing the right thing. Keep going in that direction. That's what you need to be doing. And by the way, small groups is a great place to find that kind of support. Really, all three of these. As you're, as you're wanting to accomplish your life mission, you'll find people that will come along that will help you, stimulate you mentally, and they will support you emotionally, and they will strengthen you spiritually. You find that in a small group. You certainly can find that also by going through growth track and connecting with a ministry team that will, that will be with you. And they're saying, hey, let's do this together. Let's do what God's put in our hearts and we're going we're gonna to do our dream as we do God's dream that he has for us. Okay, and then this verse here, I choose as my friend. So you get to make that choice. I choose, and not, you don't get to choose all your friends, but some you do, right? The close friends. I choose as my friends everyone who worships you and follows your teaching. Okay, so that's what you want out of a friend. That's, that's the kind of close friends you want. How do you get that? I mean, there's probably a lot of us going, yeah, I'd like that. How do you get that kind of friend in your life? They're just not, they don't magically appear. You actually have to sow into something. You have to, you have to if you want to reap something, you have to sow. And so what do you sow? You have to do some things... You, that attract those kinds of people. Here's what you can do if you want those kind of people in your life. How to build friendships like that. Number one is is get interested in other people. If you're just all about you, that's a recipe for loneliness. 
Okay, that's, you need more than just being interested in you and being selfish and self-focused. He who wants to have friends must show himself friendly. You got to go out of your way. You got to do things that are friendly. You got to invite people into your, into your, into your little world. It says an unfriendly man pursues selfish ends. It's so easy to fall into just being all about me. Let me give you an experiment. Next time you're invited to a party or some kind of social event, find somebody who you don't know at all. You've never met them and just go up and then spend about 20 minutes with them and get them talking about themselves and just kind of keep them talking and just, just learn all about them. And, and, and don't talk about you. It's just that 20 minutes is all about them. And then when you're done and you walk away, they will think, well, that person's the smartest person I've ever met. You know, <laughs> they're so friendly. Why? Because you got them talking about their favorite subject, them, themselves. That's everybody's favorite subject is me. And, uh, and, and so if, if you're going to be a good friend, you got to rise above that. You got to do more than that. You got to say, I'm interested in others. And when you do that, it starts to build a bridge towards that person. I mean, we're, we're kind of innate. That's an innate part of us, right? To be selfish. Somebody gives you a group photo and says, hey, you're in this photo. What do you look? You look for you. If you look good, it's a good photo. If you don't look good, it's not a good photo. It doesn't matter how everybody else looked. That photo sucks, man. Yeah, but look at everybody smiling. Just you. You know, you just, you know. well, it's bad. So we need, we need to rise above that. If we're going to have close friends, we can't just fall into that. Here's another one. I love this one. Smile. Smiling is a great tool. It really is. First thing is universal. Everybody gets it. You don't even have to speak the same language. You smile, people tend to smile back. Now, I'm talking about a real smile, right? Not one of those fake ones, You're like a smirk or something. You're like, that makes you want to punch somebody. I'm talking about a smile, right? You smile. Oh, man, that's disarming. It's so cool. The Bible says, a happy heart makes the face cheerful. When my kids were young, sometimes they'd come and they'd say, Dad, are you happy? And I'd say, yeah. And they'd say, well, you should tell your face. Because <laughs> they wouldn't know. They were wondering, you know, is Dad happy? Is he not? Some of you need to do that. You need to tell your face, I'm happy, and let other people know. There's something very, very powerful when we smile. Somebody said, a smile is the shortest distance between two people two people. You know, what makes me sad is, is that married people, especially married people that have been married for a while, a lot of times the spouse never sees the smile anymore. Everybody else gets to see their smile. They're, you know, they're filling up gas, they're waving, they're, you know, at the checkout, you know, they give a big grin, a big smile at work, they're smiling. They come home, it's you again, you know. <laughs> no smile for the spouse, that's a problem. You need to reserve smile time for your spouse. They should see you smile. And your kids as well. Certainly you should be smiling. You know, as a Christ follower, it should come naturally. It really is an embarrassment to God that we don't smile. So for some people, it's like Christians, they, they don't bring joy to a room. It's like joy, the room lights up when they leave. It shouldn't be like that, right? We should bring joy to people into the room. We bring it with us. We're carriers of joy. The Bible says that the Spirit of God, one of the fruit of the Spirit, gives us joy. Gives us joy. And the message that we, that the, that we march to the, is, is the good news. It's the good news. It says, I bring you the most joyful news ever announced. Ever announced. There's been some good news over the years. People win big lottery money, all kinds of stuff. Ever announced, and it is for everyone. This is the news we carry inside us. And that should make you smile. That should bring joy to people around you. Not just, not just strangers and people you don't see very much. You know, Jesus smiled. You say, well, how do you know? Well, because he's human. And human smile. And also, he, was the, he embodied the Spirit of God more than anybody. And so he had joy. He smiled. We don't have a photo of what Jesus looked like, but I think if some people have drawn what it would look like if Jesus, they said, here's a, like a, what it would look like if we caught a picture of him smiling. Here's, I found this on the internet. Here, pop that up there. Yes? No? Not today. Okay. Is it not working? Oh, okay. 
Isn't that kind of cool? I mean, he's like, he just cracked a big joke, or John did. Somebody's going, something's going down there. But it makes you want to smile. Here's the thing. God's not angry with you, okay? He's smiling at you. The Bible says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so there, that's good news. God is happy with you. He smiles at you. Jesus put a smile on God's face. And it should put a smile on your face. Now, let me ask you, are you happy right now? Like my kids used to ask me, are you, are you looking forward to this coming week? Are you glad that you have your health? Are you happy that you live in Virginia Beach? Do you? Here, raise your hand. Are you happy that, well, then you need to, you need to let your face know, right? Let your face know. And, you know, here's some good news. Did you know smiling only takes six muscles? Frowning takes 42. You actually save energy by smiling. Okay, so you relax. You can save energy and build friendships. Number three, don't be a chronic complainer. You know, where we just, that's what everybody does. So it's going to be hard because that's like the current is going that direction. You're going to be swimming against the current. You're going to say, hey, I don't want to be the chronic complainer. It says, do everything without complaining or arguing. And it goes on to say that if you aren't, a complainer, you actually will stand out like a bright star in, in a dark night. I mean, you'll just, you're just going to be different. What I think is interesting is, is that most people don't even, they're not even aware of how much they complain. Did you know that? Most people, they don't, they're not even clued in. I mean, they just, you, you, there's some people, that's all they do is complain. You know, oh yeah, well, I didn't get a ticket to the music festival. No. And my gas mileage isn't like it's supposed to be. And gas is going up anyways. And my investments aren't doing well. And my boss is always riding me. My spouse and my girlfriend, they're always upset. And they never have any energy. And my kids are always doing something wrong. And, 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 you know, this and this and that and blah, 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 blah. And then if you say to them, hey, did you know you kind of complain a lot? No, no, I'm just a realist, you know. <laughs> I don't really complain a lot. Well, yeah, you do. Well, how do you know? It's actually, it's kind of a blind spot. It really is. It's kind of this area of complaining. We want to obey what God says. We want to have more friends because if you're always complaining, you're, you're, look, nobody wants to hear it. You know, I got this pain. I got this problem. I got this. I got this. Uh, why don't you go away? You know, nobody wants that. So you need to put that as, how do you know if you're a complainer? You need to find a couple trusted people. And, you, and, and, and say, listen, be honest with me. Do I complain? And when they say yes, don't complain about it, right? <laughs> say, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to start changing. What you need to do is just get up in the morning. The very first thing you say is every single phrase that comes out of my mind. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to make sure it is positive. It's not a complaint. And when you do that, it's going to change everything. People are going to really come go, wow, what's wrong? You're different now. You're different. Because there's always something to complain about. Reminds me of the guy who uh, went to the florist. He was upset. He's complaining. He's chewing this florist up and down, saying, hey, I ordered some flowers, and you got them mixed up because the flowers that he had ordered went to somewhere else. And he goes, so I ordered some. Uh, a friend of mine was, had a housewarming, and I sent some flowers. And I go to the housewarming, and the flowers say, rest in peace. I said, that's... You can't do that. She goes, hey, you think you're complaining. You think about the person who has a set of flowers at their funeral, and it says, good luck in your new location. <laughs> There's always something to complain about, right? So we need to step above that. Number four, accept people unconditionally. Accept people unconditionally just as they are. What that means is when you have a friend somebody in your life, a relationship, you have to decide at the front end, I'm not on this secret agenda to change you. You don't have to change for me to accept you. Accept each other just as Christ accepted you. Thankfully, that's how God accepted us, right? If he had said, oh, you have to do all these things, you have to change just like that, none of us would have had a chance. But he says, just as you are, and we walk across that bridge, and he built that bridge to us. And so that's the kind of bridge we build. We say, I don't, you don't have to change for me to love and accept you. Again, it doesn't mean that you approve of everything that somebody does, but it means that, hey, I'll, 
you're not going to. And, you know, sometimes people change because of this. When we love them, when we accept them unconditionally, they change. Sometimes they don't. But you've given up your secret agenda to change them. Now, let me just say, there's a caveat here. There's some people that are close to you that are not supposed to be your friends. If you are a parent of a child, especially a young kid, but probably a teenager as well, they're probably not supposed to be your friend. That's, that's the wrong season. Later they will. But when they're little, you need to be their parent. They only have one, right, or two. You know, they, they, they don't, there's not many of you, and so they can have all these other friends. You need to be their parent. Inherently, a, see, we're talking about, see, a parent wants their kid to change, especially if they're little. Hey, you need to change. That's not acceptable. You go around biting people. That's not acceptable. You do this, you do that. I need you to, you're helping, guiding them to change. It's true if you're an adult, by the way, and you're, you have a mentor relationship with somebody, you have to make, and you're or, or discipling. You, if, you, if you become their friend, it's all about accepting who they are. And they need those people, but you have to decide, is that the role you're playing in that person's life? If you're the mentor, that's not your place. You're there to help them change. You're able to draw something out of them and, 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 and bring correction like parents do. Now, that being said, if you're married, that is not the role you're supposed to be playing is to change your, your spouse. Right? Have you figured that out? That they, the more you try to change them, the more they resist. You know, it's just kind of like, okay, what do you? Let's do it. I'm in. I'm ready. What do you? What do you? What do you? What don't you like about me? And then we try to change them. And if we work long enough, maybe we get them to change the way we want them to be. And then when they change that way, we don't like them anyways. We think oh, I liked you better the other way. It's just not even the way you're supposed to do it. Okay, if you're married, you accept them. You love them just as they are. You know, the Bible says there that, uh, that we're supposed to honor people. We're supposed to honor. It says a friend loves at all times. That's what we're supposed to do. This is love at all times and, and, learn, and learn how to connect, make a connection that way, okay? Number four, help people feel significant. Help people feel significant. Here's the honor verse I was looking for. Honor one another above yourself. Honor one of in other words, people need you need to be looking. How can I help other people feel special, feel significant, feel like they matter? Because this is what people want. Deep down, they all want it. Everybody needs to feel like my life is significant. And the truth is, it is significant. So you're looking for ways to build them up, to encourage them. If you're uh, an owner of a business, if you're a manager, you have responsibility to help your employees see how they fit into the big picture. That's, that gives them significance as opposed to just, yeah, just do your job, you know. All you have to do is just, just punch in, do this, punch out. That strips significance out of them. So you want to help them see this is what we're doing with our company. This is how we're changing lives. This is, and they get to hear about it. It makes them feel powerful. makes them feel, hey, I matter. My life makes a difference here. And if you're a parent, again, that's an opportunity for you to speak into your, your, your kids' lives like nobody else can. When you speak into them, tell you, you tell them, hey, you matter to God. You, when my kids were real little, uh, we would put them to bed at night, of course. And uh, my kids are real close together, about one year apart, three boys. We'd put them to bed. And, uh, and my boys, they had a lot of energy. I mean, they were, they were rambunctious. They had a lot of fun. It was great having, I mean, there, were, there was always high octane going on in our home. Except for a moment, right, when they, were, they weren't asleep yet, but they were in bed and they'd calmed down a little bit. And there was that moment there where they were just kind of real receptive. And it was in those moments, as, I tried every night. As, if I was home, I did this. I'd go into their rooms and I would just speak life into them. I'd just tell them how important they are, how God's got a mission for them, how they have a purpose. They were created for a reason. And then I would pray over them and speak life and bless them and say, God, do something great in their life and help them to realize it, help them to hear your voice. That's something special that I could do, that I could speak into their lives. And you can do that. It's not too late, no matter how old your kids are, maybe not that exact thing, but you can still speak life into your kids. You can still do it. And it makes a big difference. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, like everybody gets a trophy. You lose and you still get a trophy. No, that actually ruins people's self-esteem, right? They've proven that now. But I'm talking about everybody matters to God. 
Everybody has value and everybody has gifts. And so it's part of our job is to help them figure it out. And when it says honor others above yourself, does that mean you, you like talk bad about yourself? Oh, I'm just a lousy person. I'm, I'm just a worm. I'm no good. No, it's not talking about that. You should have a great view of yourself, but you are always looking to honor people above yourself. That makes a big, that makes a big difference in friendships. Number six is sympathize. In other words, you need to share your emotions. You've got emotions. You've got to get in touch with them. You start to share them. Look at this verse here. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. So we share our emotions. Part of the reason that God allows us to go through difficult times, you lose your job you've had for years, you lose you, you, the ability to use your leg or your arm, you know, one of your, one of your body parts, you, you get cancer, you lose a loved one, you got hooked on opioids, all kinds of things that we go through. The part of the reason we're, we go through those is we can sympathize. If we never had any problems, we wouldn't be able to sympathize. Somebody would come up, they'd be a mess, they'd go, wow, Whew. sucks to be you. I, you know, I just don't know. You know, I mean, you're, you're, you know, I, I can't relate at all. But we can relate. We can sympathize. We actually feel that way because we went through that. And there's something very, very powerful when somebody comes along and they've gone through something just like you. They've gone, you when, they, when they've gone through something like you're going through, they don't really have the answers, but that, that emotional connection, is, it builds a friendship. It really does. It builds a strong friendship. And so you can be there. You can support them. You can say, hey, you know, I'm there for you, and I, I know what you're going through. Here's a definition of a friend. A friend is somebody who laughs at your jokes when they're not that good. I consider you guys all my friend for that. <laughs> and sympathizes with you, your problems, even when they're not really that bad when they're not that bad. And so it's not just in the, in the, in the bad times, but also in the good times. Part of sympathizing and, and emotionally sharing this is when something good happens to somebody, you're not jealous. You're not like, oh, well, all the good things happen to others. No. You know, if you can rejoice when good things happen to other people, you'll be happy all the time because good things are happening to other people all the time, just not you. Okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. It feels that way, so doesn't it? But if you can be happy for other people and rejoice when good things happen. Uh, I talked to a friend of mine. I try to call some of the pastors uh, after Easter each year. And so I talked to one of the pastors this past week. I said, hey, how'd your Easter go? He goes, Andy, it was amazing. We had all these people come to Christ. We had all these baptisms. And I got a one check. One guy came up to me, gave me a check. I thought it was 50000 It was 500000 Half a million dollars from one person. I was happy for him. I could have said, dang, I could have used that money. <laughs> we need our elevator so bad. <laughs> oh, God, oh, God. And hung up on him. Yeah. No, you rejoice with him. Praise God. God's doing great things for you. And so I can be happy. Hey, I'm happy for him and all the other things that are happening to other people. It's a beautiful thing. Right? Lastly, stick with them through tough times. Stick with them through tough times. Everybody goes through tough times from time to time. There are friends who pretend to be friends, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. When you're there, when they're going through difficult times, that's what a friend does. That's, the, that, that, that's a game changer. You know, s surveys show, studies show that very, very, very wealthy people, they don't really know who their friends are. They always wonder, down deep, if I lost all my resources, would, I still, would these people still be around? And it's just, it's just a tension that they don't, you know, and they don't want to lose all the resources to figure it out. They just never really know. You know, when you lose, you might not have lots of money, but you have other things. And when you go through life and you lose things, you might lose your health. You might, you might go through mental illness. You might go through the loss of a spouse. You might do some dumb things that contribute to some problems in your life. A friend will stick there. They're not going to come in and judge you and make you, you know, feel all bad. They're going to be, be with you. Let me give you a definition of a friend, okay? A friend, a close friend in your life, you can say the most heretical thing, and they're not going to blast you. They're not going to blow you away. Also, if you do something real dumb, they'll confront you, and you won't blast them, right? You won't, you won't 
slap him around, yell at him, get defensive, mad at him. Somebody, you need to have, based on that, how many friends do you have? Because you need that. I need somebody in my life who can come up and say, Mead, you're off base there. Mead, you're doing it wrong. You need to do something different here. I need, uh, otherwise I'm in, I'm in my own little capsule. I'm living my own little, my own little life. It says two are better than one because if one falls, the other lifts him up. Pity the man who is all by himself when he falls. That's not God's best for any of us that we're all by ourselves. We don't let anybody speak into our lives. Let anybody support us. We need people that, that lift us up, that challenge us, that stimulate us mentally, and they support us emotionally, and they strengthen us spiritually. People that come alongside you, and, 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 and they're not, you know, they're just, they're there to be, they've chosen to be your friend, and you've chosen to be their friend. You've decided, hey, uh, you know, I, I know I have this selfish nature, but I'm going to try to not be too selfish here. I'm going to try to bring joy. I'm not going to complain so much. I'm going to try to come and, 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 and be a bridge builder in this relationship. And rejoice when you rejoice. And, and walk with you when you're going through difficult times. And stick with you through the, difficult, through the tough times. This is, this is the bridges that, we are, we're, that God wants us to build. And we can do it. And we need to really do it together because it's not a solo art. It's not a solo sport. It's something inherently building relationships is something we do together. Okay, let's bow our heads. We'll pray. Well, Lord, we know that friendships are important. But it's in the doing it that makes it so difficult. So, Lord, I want to pray for those. As I was praying over the service and praying over you, I, I felt like some of you are, a couple things I feel God showed me. One is, is I think some of you are struggling with loneliness. You know, you have friends, but they're not the friends that we just talked about and that, that we saw in Scripture that the Bible says that we need. And so you have this emptiness, this loneliness that goes with that. You need close friends. You really do. And God wants that for you. And so I'm going to pray for you. Also, I believe there's some parents that you've tried to be friends with your kids, and maybe it's motivated out of the loneliness, maybe not, but you've tried to be, and it's not the season. You're, you're preemptive. There will be that season. But it's actually more destructive and harmful trying to be their friend when they're young or maybe even in their teenage years, especially for some of you have tried to become your, your teenager's friend. And God's word for you is, is it's, this isn't the time. They still need a parent. They need somebody who will speak truth into their life that loves them enough to say, the way you're going is going to hurt you. And I'm going to pray for you. And then there's a third group here that God wants to be your friend. He didn't come to just bring a relation, to, to bring a religion. He came, and, and, and there's this gap. You really look honestly at your relationship with God, and you know that there's not that close friendship. And I'm going to pray with you. So let me pray. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name. I invite your presence here right now. Thank you, Lord, that you care so much for us. You want us to discover that we matter. Our lives matter. We don't have to live life alone. Lord, I pray for those who don't have close relationships that this would be the end of that season. That starting now, you're going to be walking into a new season and God's going to bring you at least one close friendship. At least one. But Lord, I pray for more than that. And if it means you have to step into a small group, go through growth track, do what you need to do. God's going to, he's going to do his part. You do yours. 
Do these seven things we talked about. Lord, I pray for parents here that are struggling in their parenting. And for, for some reason, whatever's going on, they're, wanting to, they're trying to be their, their kid's friend. And that's not what God has for you right now. That's, that, that would be like the preferred job. It's no fun being the parent. It's, you're the person the kid doesn't like now. And that's okay. God says, that's okay if your kid does not like you right now. Because your role, unlike anybody else on this planet, you have a special role to fulfill. Whether you're the parent, you might be a step-parent, you might be a grandparent that's in that role, you step into that. Say, hey, there'll be a different season to find a friend in, the, in this child. This isn't it. And so, Lord, I pray that you give them strength, you give them the support they need. Lord, I, I thank you, Lord, for the courage it takes to be that kind of parent. And then lastly, I want to pray for those of you who are far from God. Jesus said that I no longer call you my servants, I call you my friends. That is an invitation, he says to you. He wants you to be friends. And that doesn't mean going to church or going to a small group. It doesn't mean any of that. What it means is you recognize that Jesus paid that price on the cross so that all of the things that would get in the way, all of the things that are selfishness, our our, uh, our anger, our, our, our self-defeating things we do, all the things we try to do, those just don't have to get in the way anymore. God reaches his hand out to you to be your friend. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me. I want you just to pray right where you're at. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or stand up, but I am going to ask you to let God know, hey, I want to be your friend. I want to follow what Christ says, his teachings, to the best of my ability. And I'm ready to do that right now. If that's you, then I want you to let God know that you're serious. And you do that just by raising your hand right where you're at. Just do, raise your hand, okay? Lift it high. Bless you. Okay, lift your, just raise your hand up. There you go. Bless you. Is anybody else? That's right. You're saying, hey, I want to be God's friend. I'm, tar- I'm, I'm not on the performance track anymore. That's done. Okay, you can put your hands down. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, come right now. Let your spirit resonate inside everybody who just raised their hands. Deep down in their heart to know that they're loved. Okay, so now it's your turn. Would you whisper just to God and say, God, help me to discover how much you love me. Would you do that? Help me to discover how much you love me that I am called for a purpose and that my primary relationship will be with you more than any other person than just say, God, thank you for reaching out to be my friend, dying on the cross for me, putting your spirit in me. Give, would you say, God, give me the power to live this life In Jesus' name, amen. We are excited to introduce two ways you can give to Vineyard. The first is text giving. You can now give wherever or whenever you want by simply texting the word VCC and the specific amount you want to give to 45777. After texting your gift, you will receive a reply informing you that your donation has been received. If this is your first time texting this number, you will receive a text reply that prompts you to follow the link and complete the one-time account setup. That's it. Your account will be set up and your gift is complete. Lastly, online giving. You can do this by going to our church's giving page and following the prompts to give. Log in by using your mobile phone number and secure PIN or your email and password. Once you've accessed your giving account, you can give a one-time gift or set up a recurring gift scheduled to go out on the date you choose. If you would like to give to a specific area of our ministry, make sure to designate your gift using the fund drop down menu. If you have any questions about any of these ways to give to our church, feel free to swing by the information desk or email admin at vineyardchurch.com for assistance. Thank you for your continued generosity to our church.